Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is the super amazing 266th episode being recorded on August 28th, 2013. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Alan Malventano. And I'm Maury Tattleman. We have a group of four. Jeremy is at the uh, uh, Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus, Best of Both Worlds concert, I think, that's going on right now. So he'll be back with us next week. Twerking. Hey, you know what? He's just twerking at the concert, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, can, you can imagine Jeremy with his back twerking. I don't want to imagine it, I guess. Yeah. Is what it you know what's neat to? about that? 266 is a number that sticks in my mind. Can you name off the reasons why? Uh, Frontside bus. That's a good one. What else? What's, what's the first major 266 that was really expensive? Pentium. Pentium 2, 266. Okay. That's what everybody wanted. All right. Everybody. Okay. Where's 1500 bucks when it was first released. Can you believe it? Uh, yes. Yes, because Intel still sells a $1,000 desktop processor. Is it the P2266? No. Oh, okay. No. no. Does it run at 266 megahertz? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's coming up this week? Uh, oh, I know. I have... Have you guys heard about this uh, Hearthstone game? It's a collectible card game uh, from the makers of World of Warcraft. I don't know. Anybody? You might know what this no. is. Didn't, didn't Steam try to do that during their last sale and it failed miserably? No, that's, so that's different. That's like a you get cards for playing games and then you trade. This is actually like, it's like a dumbed down Magic the Gathering, I guess is what people are. Nobody's calling it that. But it's World of Warcraft, uh, Blizzard is obviously making it and it's it's called hearthstone it's in beta and the reason i mention this is because i don't have a key for it and i'm very sad and i want to try it and so if anybody has a beta key that they would like to send to ryan they should do that i don't have any money you could borrow <laughs> you, you should you should give the whole email you my have. email address is you can just email Ryan at PCPer.com. That works, actually. Once so. again, that's K Addison, A D D I S O N, <laughs> at You don't have a PC that will work. You can't even Wait, play are we it. Talking about a it's card game? We're talking about a card game on the computer. It's a card game on the computer. Okay, because yeah. Blizzard came out with a World of Warcraft card game when, right shortly after World of Warcraft. Yeah. Debuted. This, this is, the, I don't know how related they are, to be honest with you. I just saw uh, some videos of it. It looks pretty cool. And uh, are you gonna do? Are you I don't gonna have frame rate it. Frame rate. I, frame I rate will card game? tell you what. If you give me a beta key, if somebody gives me a beta key, I will frame rate that bitch. I will frame rate. I will. Their stuff I will see how smooth the animations are in that Blizzard game. Uh, so let's let's do that. I thought there was another note I had up here at the beginning to talk about something off topic, but I can't think of anything. So we'll just move on. Uh, a couple of reviews before we jump into a bunch of news this week. Actually, the Corsair Carbide series, is that right? It's Carbide, right? Air 540 carbide. is a is a case that I think we talked about when we were at QuakeCon because I saw several people at QuakeCon using it, uh, and, I, and I think I saw a couple of case mods based on this design. So the it's a unique new case from Corsair, um, and it it's it's a full size ATX device. Uh, that's not what I'm showing. <laughs> No, reset it. Restart it. It's not going to work. You just switched to that window again. Yeah, I did. Now undo it. Yeah, see, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> there we go. Hey! All right. Hey. No, not working. Great. Perfect. Uh, so the Corsair Carbide Air 540 is a uh, kind of a different case. It's it's. I think it's fairly unique. You guys can correct me if you know of another one that's kind of like it. Uh, that fits full-size ATX components but um, has like two compartments side by side. So like the power supply is actually in a different compartment to the right, if you're looking at the front of it. Uh, Doesn't Cooler Master have one, except it's on its side? On its are you, are you side. Thinking, are you thinking of, of the, the uh, of, uh, thermal takes one that they did with uh, BMW, what's that called, the level no, 10? No, 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 no. Let's do Cooler Master half... It's the one. It's the, oh, half, the half XB, XB case. Oh yeah, the half XB. I did a review on that a couple of weeks ago. Or a then ago. why didn't you remember it? <laughs> I don't. Have you been oh, smoking that's so, that's, crack that's again, the Maury? one that was making all that noise. Maybe turn off. 
Oh. Is that uh, does that have the window on top? Uh, no, I didn't get the version with the window on top, but it does have. Did one you have a version with that? Okay, that's it's interesting. Optional. It's Some optional. people in the comments on our video were asking specifically for that. So the idea is. Um, Take the half XB, I guess, rotate it 90 degrees so that the window is facing in the kind of standard direction of a window. And uh, you, you know, your, your motherboard, your graphics card, all that kind of stuff is pointed in that direction. Uh, and on the back side, in a separate compartment, is where your power supply lives, where your optical drives live, where your SSDs live. Uh, and, and you kind of get an idea of what it is. It's, it's, more, it's almost kind of a cube shape as opposed to a... Um, uh, Slender tower, yeah, the it's golden ratio. Cor yes, that, yeah. Uh, so it, it's an interesting design. I actually Ken actually built uh, the system that we took to QuakeCon in it, and uh, he seemed to like the process. I like the fact I, that the window. I, was I enormous. did unspeakable things to that case while I was at Giggle QuakeCon. GiggleCon, <laughs> you were at GiggleCon. GiggleCon, GiggleCon, unspeakable. Is, that's in October. So the I like the window on the side because it's it's enormous. It like takes up almost the entirety of uh, the panel, right? So you. Boy, that's you, that's big. It <laughs> takes up it takes up a ton of space, and, and so you get to see all the components inside of it. So that side's not very unique. Uh, it's when you scroll down uh, and we look at the back. If you do that, you'll see that um, what we have here is in, in the back the power supply and a very kind of a messy cable routing system. But that's one of the benefits of the Corsair case design is that the front of it where the window is looks very nice while the back of it can look like whatever. Uh, it, it has room for the power supply. It does not have a, a filter, which some people were complaining about. Um, and the S, it'll hold four SSDs. In the front, it actually will hold... Um, let me see if I can find a, a picture of that. Yeah, if we switch to that one there, you'll see the front actually has support for two three and a half inch drives and that's all this case by default will support is two three and a half inch hard drives so i think that might be a little bit uh modest so alan would never be able to use this case uh for sure because you can't fit eight three and a half inch you know four terabyte hard drives in it uh the other kind of hiccup i had with it was the back part where the optical drives go they're 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 rotated 90 degrees which i think is is cool people you know, we're complaining about the idea of sideways discs are always a bad idea, which there's some validity to that. Uh, but the main problem I had was the cage that holds the optical drives um, kind of covers up a couple of the uh, grommeted holes for the uh, where the, the ATX power cables and stuff would go through. Yeah, you can see it right there in that photo. And if the optical drive bay cage is there, it's really, really hard to get that cable in. You might be able to do it, but especially if you have an optical drive installed, it's pretty much impossible. So um, I would say that that is the, the, the two major gripes with it is kind of the lack of three and a half inch drive expansion. Uh, but it has room for a 280, 280 millimeter radiator up top, a 360 on the front, a 140 on the back. Uh, it has you know a lot of expansion there in terms of like room to actually build Things and it comes with three of Corsair's really nice uh, AF. Uh, I forget what the exact model number is. The, the, I think they're 140s, aren't they? I think they're AF 140 something. They're the, the, the low noise version of the fans. They're actually really high quality fans. Um, it's reasonably priced, I would say, at about 139 bucks, 140, depending on where you look. And it's I, I like it. I think it's a unique design. Um, it's got some interesting features. You know, we'd like to see more front panel USB ports than what most cases are offering these days. Uh, but uh, I do I do think that the case has a, has a lot of potential. But I don't know. What do you guys think about this kind of cube-shaped design? Like, they, they call it like a – I think they call it like direct airflow something or other where they try to – you know, they make it sound like moving the power supply – to another compartment, the optical base to another compartment will somehow improve performance pretty dramatically. I doubt that's really the case, but if nothing else, it allows them to do a unique design and kind of uh, change things aesthetically uh, and give you a lot more space to just kind of shove all your cable clutter back there if that's what you want to do. It was a I, it was a cool case. It just seemed like there was uh, like too much extra space in the back, maybe. But you know, if you have the desk space um, for it, there's never too much extra space. <laughs> ever, ever. <laughs> Um, Ken says he wants a mini ITX version. That could be cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, you could you could water cool it and put all the pump in the reservoir and all the stuff and hide it if you wanted to, but usually people don't do that, I guess. Now, see, well, what, what you could do with that case, and what I bet you some people at QuakeCon did, was they had a window on the other side, too, to show off their... Because a lot of times, if someone's doing... If someone spends a lot of time on case modding, they're going to spend a lot of time on cabling and cable routing and all, and some of the, some of the more innovative cable routing and cable designs are going to want to show that off. So they'll have lights and all that stuff on the back as well, or I wouldn't be surprised by that. So, I mean, because some of them, some some of this stuff, sometimes the, the stuff that they do behind the scenes to do actually the cable routing all is a lot cooler looking than than the actual front of the board. I would, I would, I'm I'm a not clean PC builder, so the idea of having more space just to shove cables back there is great by me. And actually, it was interesting. We got an email on Twitch. A couple of weeks ago, specifically asking for, hey, I have one of these cases that has like an inch or an inch and a half on the back door side where cables go, but I need more space than that for cables. Is there a case that offers that? And I was like, hey, this has like five or six inches of space back there. You should have plenty of room uh, for any of the uh, rat's nest of cables that you may And, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a case when you actually stand up next to it. It it. No, it's, it's just not. not. I mean, because I mean, the dimensions are such a way that uh, yeah, yeah, well, it, it just doesn't seem that big. If you look at the picture of with the components in it, you'll see that like I mean, the height wise, you're only you only have to worry about the motherboard height essentially, right? There's a couple of inches left at the bottom for uh, you know like the extended uh, length boards, and a little bit at the top to to fit radiators. But height wise, it's it's pretty small. You you gain a little bit on the width. In order, because you're basically rotating the power supply along the side, but uh, I I think it's I think it's well worth it. I th it fit uh, Radeon 7990 in there, so it'll fit full length graphics cards. It's I mean it's a full you can do a whole lot of enthusiast building in this, and you don't really have to uh, to worry about it. I I, I I like it. Check go to the go to the website, check out the video. You can see us uh, do the walkthrough of the build that we put in there and show you you know the, the couple little keys that I didn't like the three and a half inch drives and the optical bays. Uh, and like I said, it's only $140, so it's not really that expensive either. Uh, we do have a new reviewer to introduce with a review of the Razer Black Widow Ultimate Stealth 2013 Edition keyboard, which is a lot of words for a um, what I would call a distinct, or what he calls a distinct product line. Have you guys used or do you use any of Razer components? Keyboards, mice, anything like that? I've looked at yeah. them, but I don't. Just haven't tried yeah. any. What about like just mechanical keyboards in general? I'm still a hermit. Still a hermit. Still a hermit. Josh? I, I I use have... No, no mechanical. No mechanical. I still have my trusty old Satec whatever keyboard from years ago. I'm stuck using those natural style keyboards, the split keyboards, because my uh, carpal tunnel stuff started kicking in a couple years ago. That's the only way I can keep it in check and not have to wear one of those weird Ken wrist says, guards. Ken or says somebody surgery. does make a mechanical ergonomic keyboard, if you want to look that up. I don't know who it, you don't know who it is. But. They, they just released that, and I think, uh, what, an on tech had uh, one of the first reviews of that. Okay. Was it positive or negative? I didn't read it. All I just saw was gotcha. the uh, it's the Ergo Docs. Yeah, Ergo Docs is the name of the mechanical hmm. keyboard right. via Mass Drop. Well, that uh, sounds intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> the Razer. I got to look at this name again. Razer Black Widow Ultimate Stealth is a mechanical keyboard, a traditional format mechanical keyboard, green backlight on it, which I I think it, it's definitely the calling card of Razer. I think it's actually a pretty attractive look for uh, keyboards. Um, it has USB pass-through. It's got a lot of, of high-end features on it. Uh, the Black Widow Ultimate uses the quieter Cherry MX Brown switches, which uh, if you go to the article, you can see a sweet animated GIF of how they I work. I it was GIF. I'm sticking with GIF. I don't really care what those people say. Uh, so to hell with them, I guess. Um, and uh, we also he also walks through the software. Chris does and talks to you about how you can set the macro keys and um, you know what kind of other options you have in software. It's uh, I'm I'm usually the kind of person that doesn't bother installing software for things like keyboards and mice, but as 
more of these devices are released that have pretty cool features like uh, the Corsair K60 and K90. I'm sorry. Yeah. K60 and K90, when they came out, had some pretty nice software that did some uh, uh, interesting macro capabilities. Uh, that's definitely the same thing here with the uh, with the Razer software. So you can set macros easily. You could manage them. Uh, and then he gets into the experiences and conclusion part. So if you're, if you're curious about the Razer Black Widow Ultimate Stealth, give that review a rate. It is an expensive keyboard. It's about $139 on Newegg. Uh, which, you know, compared to the, like the Corsair K60 is 110, the K70 is 150. It's in that range of these high-end mechanical keyboards. It's still a lot of money even for me to consider spending on, on a keyboard. I, trust me, when I bought keyboards here for the office, I bought like $50 mic Logitech or Microsoft combos or something like that because I was like, I don't really care what Ken uses. That's his problem. Uh, <laughs> And we had to buy like nine of them, and I wasn't going to buy nine hundred and something dollar keyboards. Plus, when you're recording video, mechanical keyboards, not a very good idea. Just ask Jeremy about that, because I made him change it. Um, so yeah, there's that. So check the, check out that review and and welcome him to the uh, the writing fold at PC Per, if you will. Uh, what else we have? Oh, we reviewed a video card. Josh is probably a little jealous about this one, though. Dude, I'm 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 just jealous of your life. So, it's not always greener on the other side, Josh. It's not always greener. Yeah, I know. You could get a flat tire on the way to a Bengals game. <laughs> you could just, <laughs> you could just have to deal with the rest of the crap I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to make sure that you know everybody still has things to do in this yeah. world. So anyway, this is what we took a look at um, for my other review this week. This is the MSI GeForce GTX 780 Lightning Edition graphics card. It's black and yellow, black and yellow, and um, follows the theme that is very common, I guess, through the Lightning. What, I, the, the 680 was black and yellow as, as well, wasn't it? The six, I have no idea. I never got it. 680 Lightning was? Okay. Um, so this is a GTX 780, which means it's a GK110 GPU Two more SMX units to save them for 2,304 CUDA cores or something like that. It's got the same output that you're used to seeing on NVIDIA uh, Kepler-based cards now, 2 DVI, HDMI, DisplayPort. Um, it's got three fans. You'll notice that the one in the middle is slightly smaller. It's an 80 millimeter as opposed to the two on the sides that are 90 millimeter. Does this make it look like a giant mustache by chance? No. Hey, Ryan, that bump thing on the back, was that the, is that an LED... Thing. Uh, it's the GPU reactor, uh, which is actually just a plastic cover over uh, very large capacitors. Is that right, Josh? Essentially? Yeah, it's it's a series of capacitors that uh, provide power directly to the back of the GPU. So here's some of the cool features about it. So right, so this is this is a the the regular GTX 780 is 650 dollars graphics card. This is a hundred dollars more than this is 750 bucks. What do you get for that hundred dollars? What is what is the point of buying something like the Lightning? What do you get, Ryan? Well, Josh, uh, it comes overclocked out of the box for one. Default clock speed is 863 for the uh, this GPU. This one runs at 980 by default. A, a, a good a good jump, not huge, but a good jump. Um, you get a completely redesigned cooler. So this is what they call the tri frozer. So you what was the other one before that? The the twin frozer. Twin frozer. I was going to say dual frozer, but I knew that was right. So twin frozer had two fans. Trifrozer has three fans, and uh, the black and yellow black fans are controlled by one uh, fan controller. The yellow one has its own separate fan controller, and they are controlled internally by the BIOS of the card, depending on what components are um, you know, heating, up. heating up at that particular time. Uh, the cooler has seven super pipes, seven super pipes, which are eight millimeter. That's like five pipes. more super pipes than you're allowed by law. I, yeah, I think so. It's very heavy. It's very dense uh, graphics card. It's very like the heatsink is very heavy on it, which I think is is good. And because of that, they uh, put a backplate on here as well that kind of they say helps strengthen the PCB. So when it's installed, you don't get any the 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 PCB flex that affected something like the uh, HD seventy nine ninety after uh, heavy usage and when it started to get really warm. Um, so the fans are good. The heatsink is good. Uh, maybe more important is the redesigned PCB on this. So this is not a reference design PCB. It has things like 
Uh, let me uh, scroll down a little bit here and go to, yeah, this is a good one here. So they have things like the, uh, what do we call these? This is the military class four components, things like uh, Dr. Moss four MOSFETs, uh, super ferrite chokes, high seat capacitors rated at 93%, dark solid capacitors, uh, very similar to the components that Mori is probably dealing with on the M Power Z87 motherboard. They also use military class four components. Um, they have three independent power controllers, which is a, a, apparently very unique here. Uh, and it actually, they do something that I'm not sure, you know, they, they tell us all this stuff and I, and I don't know exactly how it applies to the, you know, engineering in this regard, but the the, the two 8-pin power connectors, they power directly the GPU and memory as opposed to getting some of that power from the PCI Express bus. The PCI Express bus is used for the auxiliary devices where it gets the, it, it, it selects, selectively gets the power directly from the PCI Express power connectors uh, going to the, the GPU and the memory. And they say this creates less ripple. Um, they're able to modulate things a little bit better. They have double feedback loops to create stable overclocking current, right? So the idea here is it's not really going to affect you in your default reference states, but as you overclock memory, as you overclock the GPU, you start to push things a little bit further, uh, you're going to have a little bit better chance of staying stable because of this. Um, they have a BIOS switch on top that switches between the original mode and the LN2 mode. LN2 mode is over is not overclocked by default, but it does raise you from a 200 watt core power limit to a 900 watt core power limit, and from a 240 amp current to an 800 amp current. So I don't do with LN2, so that's a little bit beyond me. You should ask Lee what uh, power supply is able to supply <laughs> eight hundred <those> numbers. <laughs> I need a 900 watt, 800 amp power supply. Lee, ready, go. Um, through through two eight pin connectors, right? Yeah, it has um, V checkpoints, so you can check the voltage of the GPU, the memory, and the auxiliary uh, uh, power regulators directly through a voltmeter. Uh, you have the ability to modify all three of those voltage points uh, in software through the latest version of the Afterburner controller, and you can monitor those uh, three distinct temperature points through the controller as well, uh, GPU temperature, VRM temperature, and memory temperature. So this is really a over-engineered car designed specifically for overclocking. Uh, if you just want to buy it and plug it in your system and be done, you should really save 100 bucks and just get one of the default ones or maybe step up to a Titan or whatever. This is something that I really feel like if you buy this, you need to, you need to want to be hands-on with it in terms of tweaking and, and, and overclocking and trying a bunch of stuff uh, to really get the, the extra 100 bucks out of it. It's a, I think it's a pretty good-looking car. Other people in the comments have have expressed the opinion that the, like the, the GTX 770 Lightning was a better looking heatsink shroud. Uh, Ken is nodding his head, he agrees with that as well. I, you know, to, in, in my book, this looks fine, but this is the side you're gonna see anyway if you have a window, right? And at least it has the word Lightning here, right, right here. And it glows, and, and it, it changes glows. colors. It changes colors based on how much uh, amperage you're, you're, or how much wattage you're pulling. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, isn't that essentially a triple slot card, though? Yeah, let me show you that. So it's, show me how thick that puppy is. It's going to be hard to do this straight on. But if you see where the the metal is here, right, the fan shroud. So my finger is on the metal. The fan shroud sticks out past it, meaning that uh, it just kind of barely covers that third PCI Express slot. So um, I think you sort of mean quadruple slot if you count the thing on the back. Well, you can actually take that piece of plastic off if you want. Um, oh. And plus that typically goes into the CPU space rather than... Correct. Like maybe the yeah. north, maybe the, maybe the chipset Unless area, you, got to you know, something like that. So it, it would have to be a pretty extreme case for that, that to be uh, effective. Here I'll show this picture of uh, the... This is the 770 Lightning on uh, the right and the 780 Lightning on the left. So you can get an idea of kind of what the cooler changes looked like. Um, the new one is shorter, if that helps, right? I don't know. 
Uh, Performance-wise, out of the box at 980 megahertz, it competes very well with a reference GTX Titan. So it's $250 less than a reference Titan. So that's that's pretty good, right? You know, it's 750 versus a thousand. Uh, you can get almost this, almost the same performance for 250 bucks less. Plus, you have an over-engineered card that you can over overclock quite a bit. Um, it has three gigs of frame buffer instead of six gigs of frame buffer, which is worth noting. So if you're going into maybe, let's say you wanted to do some 12K gaming, maybe one 4K monitor wasn't enough for you. You needed to do three 4K monitors. Uh, you're nuts, but you should use a six gig frame buffer for sure. Uh, what else? Oh, we overclocked it. I was able to just, you know, doing, you know, kind of half a day's worth of overclocking with it, uh, get a 300 megahertz boost on the memory, taking it up to 6.6 .6 gigahertz and 140 offset, 140 megahertz offset on the core clock, uh, which actually took it to a, like a peak boost rate of uh, 1.24 gigahertz. So that's 1241 over the 863 base clock of the original GTX 780, like a reference one. So pretty significant performance increases there. Uh, and I, I, I think anytime you're talking about a $650 or $750 graphics card, you know, you're talking about a different class of gamer for the most part. Not a whole lot of people are spending in that area. If you were, all, if you were thought, you know, I think I'm going to get the 780 for $650, the GTX 780 for $650, um, but you're maybe looking at deciding which one. I think that the, 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 the Lightning card here deserves to be at the top of that list. Uh, I've seen some other people comment that the uh, the new Galaxy Hall of Fame edition GTX 780 should be at the top of that, and EVGA has their uh, 780 classified, which are also kind of highly engineered, overclocked, in, uh, you know, improved cooling designs. Uh, but I haven't seen either of those in person yet. Actually, no, I haven't. I don't think I have. Um, maybe do I have? A, do we have a 780 classified here? Or is that a 770 class? I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll check. Uh, but the, the MSI Lightning is a, it's a fantastic graphics card. It's just going to be way more expensive than most people are going to want to spend. Any thoughts? Are, are you happy you finally got your hands on one of them and were able to kind of see what I've been talking about for the last couple of years? You know, you know, you, you know, I am right. So you've, you've normally done kind of like the Lightning series and the, I would say the non-reference kind of high end, high overclock capable graphics cards. Yeah. Uh, reviews for us. And, and, and this one was, it was, it was interesting because when you look at a reference card, you know, when you go, you just kind of install the stuff and you kind of run, right? You don't really have to worry about uh, any of the changes to the PCB architecture. You're not worried about any of that kind of stuff. And, and MSI did a very good job of presenting their case as to why the Lightning GTX 780 was such a good car. They, you know, they didn't just say, hey, we have a custom PCB. Trust us. It's great, right? They came out with very concrete, here's the components we use, here's the layout we use, here's the power infrastructure we use, and, and here are the diagrams on why we think we are doing such a good job and why we think our product is better. And even just opening up the boxes, like the Lightning or the, the Matrix series, it's a different experience than just more of a standard. Because, I mean, they pack so much more stuff in. It's a lot more protected. The, I'll show you, you this, know, this picture here of uh, the box for the Lightning. It has a drawer. Sweet. It has a drawer that you pull out that has, like, the driver CD and the uh, V-checkpoint connectors and, and uh, the extra backplate and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, that does not, in the end, have anything to do with the card. No. But really, when you buy it, it's it kind of is an experience. When you unbox one of these things, it's like, wow, look what they included here. Look what they did here. Look what, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, Corinthian leather. Who the hell knows what Corinthian leather is, but damn it, I want some in my K-car. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I mean, uh... Asus was very good at this when they did their Mars graphics card and their Ares graphics cards. They're the ones that would that would show up in um, like briefcases and you know have locks on them and all that kind of stuff. And it was all about the presentation, right? Especially because you're paying twelve and thirteen hundred dollars for a a video card. So this is not quite up to that price point. Uh, but I think I think they do a good job of presentation and and and, and showing you that they put a lot of work into the video card uh, to really to really make it make it worthwhile. So did we lose one of our contestants? Really? Is Maury gone? Because it sounds I'm like here. he disappeared. Maury, are you there? I'm here. 
something ma- something magic just happened. I don't know. No, you're fine. All right. I think that he hurt Corinthian leather and he went and got his couch master. Oh, gross, dude. Dude, my couch master's sitting right over there. I'll use it. Don't you worry. Uh, one one thing that I really that is really a pet peeve of mine with video cards. Uh, you spend, well, I mean, I, I spend you know three four hundred bucks on a video card. That's about all my wife will let me spend. You know, on most. Um, the damn thing has all the caps and stuff on the back. It doesn't come with a backplate. So you know, you make one wrong move putting on a cooler or something like that, and you just destroyed. A, you have a four hundred dollar piece of paperweight. Maybe you should be more careful, Maury. This one doesn't. This one doesn't. So this one, it it has a back plate, um, yeah. but it's, it's also it's, got a front not, plate, it and it's got eight tension bolts. Yeah, to connect the two. So you you this it's it's flush though. It's below flush. So you would have to try really hard to break something off of this one. No, it just mo- most cards don't. I mean, if you Correct. spend most oh, cards do not. Like yeah, two hundred fifty, three hundred dollars in a card, they should include a back plate on it. Just I mean, put gaff tape on it or something. Maybe have you thought gaff about that? Tape. Yeah, because that'll help the thermals a lot. <laughs> it's like a heat sink. Uh, yeah. It's like a gooey glue heat sink. I, that's what I've always said. Uh, let's talk about some news. We'll run through some of this. We'll try to run through some of this quick. I may have to cut some of this out. Considering our late start uh, of things. So there was some debate, some discussion, if you will, about whether or not the Sony PlayStation 4 would have a Huma system. Um, it's called sensationalism. I'm sorry. Oh, was it me? No, you you weren't sensational. Oh, okay. You you waited to publish this until I told you exactly what's going on. So Huma Huma is heterogeneous unified memory architecture, which, as we learned actually a little bit after this posted, Josh, uh, you learned I guess that. The reason Huma exists is because HSA isn't finalized and won't be finalized by the time these APUs, AMD APUs, and these custom pieces of silicon are actually shipping, right? Correct. Yeah, it's not until 2014 when the actual specification for HSA, which will span across AMD, uh, ARM-based processors, all these guys in the actual HSA association, uh, it's it's... Yeah, it's it's not finalized yet. So AMD put out Huma, Huma 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 Huma. If okay, you don't probably remember eighties. No, I, uh, I know that you know that I know that you know that you've got some memory that I need to address. Huma Huma Huma. No. Where no. are you people from no. anyway? No, the old guys should be answering. I don't know why they're not. But. I know, Maury and Allen. Huma 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 Huma. Eddie Murphy, for God's sakes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Great. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we knew that Kabini was not HSA or Huma compliant. And we kind of figured that with Jaguar cores and GCN architecture, they may not be totally HSA or Huma compliant either. And AMD, in fact, told me after, the, after they had um, kind of talked about the PS4 and the Microsoft chips that they were not going to be fully HSA compliant. They didn't really talk about whom at that time because it wasn't actually released. <laughs> but my guess is that it, each of the chips have features that are under the Huma umbrella but are not entirely Huma compliant. That just sounds so strange. It does. So I, I, I want to point out that the, the reason all of this started is because... I don't know who ran it. Some German website ran a story where they talked with an AMD representative at Gamescom that said, oh, yeah, the PlayStation 4 is going to have a big performance advantage because it has, uh, it's, the only, it's the only system that has uh, the unified memory address space of Huma. And so, of course, the Internet blew up immediately where all the PS4 fanboys said, ha-ha, you suck, Xbox. And then, uh, and then there was a slight retraction from AMD that says, hey, hey, uh, we don't really know what's going on, guys. Don't believe what that guy said. He's probably fired a little, uh, you know, things like that. I think their exact quote was, Our spokesman made inaccurate statements about our semi-custom APU architectures and does not speak for Microsoft, Sony, or the AMD semi-custom business unit responsible. So it was kind of like a, uh, we take back what we said. We're not saying it's right. We're not saying it's wrong. But we take it back because we don't want to get in trouble from our billion-dollar customers, multi-billion-dollar customers. Um, and here's the thing. Yeah. Each of these guys controls their own 
infrastructure and software environment. They can add whatever they want to these stinking SOCs yeah. to help development, to help communication. They don't have to wait for you know uh, OpenCL to go to OpenCL 2.0. Or these, you know, C plus plus guys to to throw out C plus plus amp, uh, they can do a lot of things. And even though the architecture probably will not have the flat address space and the shared pointers and all these other things that that are integrated into Huma, there's a lot of things that they can do to cut down the development time, um, the workload on programmers, um, without having these intermediate layers that that we're waiting for. From these other industry guys, so it's a closed system. They can do whatever the hell they want. They probably will. Uh, yeah. Each of them will have different tricks that they have added in, as compared to what you know Kabini has and and uh, you know what the upcoming Kaveri has. So, yeah, development until we hear from the developers who say, hey, uh, you know, Sony has a pretty significant advantage here or Microsoft has a, a better advantage here because they've got this ES RAM. Um, you know, for now, applying standards on the PC to these chips is not effective. Am I making myself clear? Yes. Okay. I, I agree. And it was just, you know, the, the story got a lot more attention and traffic than I kind of expected it to because of this, we went back and forth with AMD a couple of times where the call and said, hey, we didn't really say that it was wrong. We just said that we weren't going to say if it was right or if it was wrong anymore. Um, so I, I, I don't know. We're, we're getting pretty close. The, uh, we did learn that PS4 is going to be released on November 15th. We don't have a date on the Xbox One yet. I thought it was November 8th. It's the 15th. No, 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 for Xbox One. No, I think that's just a rumor still. I don't, nothing's actually oh, okay. kind of come out. So. We'll have more on that as the uh, weeks progress because it'll be interesting to see how far ahead my quad Titan gaming PC with three 4K monitors will be when that happens. Uh, and other AMD news, apparently people started discussing the possibility of the AMD FX 9590, that is the 5 gigahertz turbo speed 220 watt eight core processor that released they released uh, like back in July June July I guess uh, was getting a price drop and not just a price drop but a significant price drop uh, I wrote a story here that says uh, it heard rumors about a potential price drop but the five gigahertz processor um, the likelihood of that skyrocketed as several online outlets were showing much lower than expected pricing so while uh, some of these UK outlets aria.co.uk and overclockers.co.uk used to sell this part for 699, 699 pounds. They were now selling it for 299 or 279, which is uh, a lot of money off. Um, significant, yes. Significant dollars. That, uh, let's or pounds. See, took it from $1,008 if you just do the currency conversion to $434. Um, now, what, what, was, what was kind of interesting about this, that in and of itself is not, I mean, it's, it's cool and it's interesting and we can talk about why they would do that, but it actually became more interesting because of like the drama around whether or not it was actually a price drop. AMD came out very kind of uh, aggressively and said, this is not a price drop at our request or demand. These are not um, changes that we are making in in that uh retail or e-tail market and it, it's kind of weird kind of like talking out of both sides of your mouth type of deal and they're in they're basically saying that this was never supposed to be a oem part like it was never supposed to be for sale to the consumer you were a never retail supposed part, you mean. retail part yeah you were never supposed to be able to buy a fx 9590 by itself it was either going to be sold through a system builder where you would buy a complete system you know uh probably with with crossfire graphics and all that kind of crap uh or you'd have to buy a bundle, which would be at least a motherboard, a cooler, and a processor. And all these sales where the prices are dropping are on individual processors. And when I asked AMD, you know, okay, well, if they weren't supposed to be able to sell them like this, how are they selling them like this, right? Like, obviously, they have to get them from somewhere. Well, it's because AMD does not have the iron fist of Intel. Yes. That, I mean, that's essentially it, right? They said, well, what happened was is when some of these... Uh, uh, 
bundles kind of expired in their system. They were accidentally released out and sold individually. Uh, I mean, you can buy this part on Newegg. At the time, it was, let me see if it's gone down any, uh, it was $879. It's still $879 on, uh, on Newegg, it appears. So no price cuts for the U.S., that's for sure. Um, but you could buy it individually, which you're not supposed to be able to do. So, Which means that nobody in England actually bought these processors, and now the people who bundled them are trying to get rid of them as soon as possible. I think so. I think so. And, and AMD did say that... <sighs> They, didn't, they, they said AMD was, they said they were, their exact quote was, they were going to continue to work with our valued channel partners to ensure our products are readily available to the enthusiast community, which doesn't say jack, really. But my understanding is that they were working on ways for system builders to be able to sell these platforms cheaper. And as a result, these people who were kind of maybe a little bit gray market is kind of taking them off these bundles were able to lower the prices accordingly as well. I think it's obvious that when the initial reviews came out of this from the, the couple that we actually saw, the performance was not great. Um, the price was way out of whack with the performance comparison because it was performing about on par with like a 3770K, 4770K. Yeah, 4770K. Right, which is great for AMD. I mean, if you if you ignore the, ex, the extreme power consumption and just and the cooling required for it. If you just look at it as here's a part, here's a part, um, at 400 bucks, it's a much more compelling product for somebody who is an AMD fan, for somebody who's just interested in that kind of uh, part. At $800, it was not. It, it's, it's just not a good deal. It was Nobody should be buying that part for $800. Uh, so this is the pricing that should have been at the whole time. Um, hopefully it will be. AMD kind of said, well, if you'll see price changes, but check with the system builders and you should see, you know, maybe those prices will come down. It all depends on what they decide to do with the changes we make. So it's this very, it's, it's a really stupid situation where AMD should just come out and say, uh, we cut the price here, bundles should be cheaper, systems should be cheaper, you still shouldn't be able to buy them individually because of our concerns about, you know, putting that chip into a crappy motherboard and having it fry itself, uh, which, which is, which is a valid concern. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Regardless though, if the pricing is closer to the actual performance and value that it offers, that's a plus. And I would like to see AMD be competitive. If they can't be competitive in performance per watt, being competitive in performance per dollar, is probably even better, right? So enthusiasts, some of us are dumb. We're willing to put up with 220 watt processors uh, in order to kind of support the, the teams and the communities that we, that we like, so. You know, it's kind of strange that they never put out kind of a water-cooled edition of this product. Unlike the first, what, 8170? Is that what the FX 8150? 8150. 8150. 8150. Then it had a water cooled version that you could buy. This nope. absolutely needs some kind of closed loop water cooling. It needs like a 240 radiator on it as well. Yeah, it yeah. It seems like that this would have been a much more natural, organic type. Okay, sure. natural and organic, but, uh, you know, the organic uh, thinking in terms of. <laughs> the strawberries. It needs. It needs something but it also, like this. It also, Let's offer it. It also needs a motherboard with. Um, you know, it needs like an eight-layer PCB that has, uh, you know, enough power Juice. phases to really keep this processor running. And their their biggest fear was people, somebody buy this and they put it in a $65 AM3 motherboard and it literally burns through the back of the board or something like that, which I think would be hilarious. But it would, it would kind be, of like it would the original press cuts. Yeah, well, yeah, there you go. So I understand kind of like the idea behind requiring a bundle to buy it, but it should be a processor, a water cooler, and a motherboard. Uh, but keep an eye on that if you're interested in it. The prices may come down here in the U.S. They may never come down. This could be the last processor we ever see from them in the FX series as, as well. That's been a rumor that's uh, circulating. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, real quick, uh, Steve Ballmer is going to retire sometime. If you give a crap. I don't really. Not soon enough. What's that? Not soon enough. I don't have any preference one way or the other, to be honest with you. I don't think he did a horrible job. I think... Uh, being Microsoft is pretty tough right now. 
because you're the biggest, and the only thing that can happen to you when you're the biggest is you could fall over. The and they're, software and they're pissing the off world. developers as of, like, what, today? Well, you I, guys read that? No, what they do? They're uh, not putting the 8.1 RTM on uh, TechNet or oh, yeah. MSDN. Yeah, I saw, yeah, I did see some of that. So pe- they're not getting it early before it actually gets in consumers' hands, essentially. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to come out, and then everybody's going to have to scramble to update whatever their bug fixes may be for all of that their That doesn't software. make much sense, does it? No, well, not I, really. I, they, they had speculation on uh, Windows Weekly, both um, what Paul Throt and Mary Jo Foley, whatever yeah. her name is. Um, she was saying They were saying that they heard that they're not actually going to release 8.1 for RT until sometime next year. For uh, RT, that, that, that there or? was some other technology issue. Or, I mean, and this is me trying to remember exactly sure. what they're right. saying. But I thought that they said that there were some other technology issues. And again, I'm sorry if I'm scrambling some facts here or something. But I could well, have sworn that they said it wasn't going to be till next year that they were actually going to release eight one for RT. Well, so there's there's Windows RT and then there's Windows eight, right? So I don't know if if Windows eight dot one is an RTM, which is released to manufacturing, then it's going to be available really soon, isn't it, Alan? Uh, not for a couple months, unless, you know, it's like mid-October. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, maybe maybe they'll change their mind. Hey, Microsoft, if nothing else, is good at recanting on all their decisions. So <laughs> here's another area for them to do that at. Uh, news with NVIDIA. Apparently they like games still. They announced this week uh, that they were working closely with Ubisoft to enhance fall PC games. What I thought was interesting, what I thought was interesting about this was that they never once mentioned the term the way it's meant to be played. Does that seem odd to you? It does seem odd because they've spent millions of dollars over the years for the way it's meant to be played. Yeah, like the what they're talking about is, hey, uh, the, the NVIDIA enhanced PC games covered in this alliance include Splinter Cell Blacklist, which is out now, Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag... We lost one. Watch Dogs. Uh, they're talking about implementing technologies like DX11 effects, parallax mapping, ambient occlusion, tessellation, HBAO, which is horizon-based ambient occlusion. So these are all things that you would normally expect to see in a, you know, the way it's meant to be played game you know, on the NVIDIA side or a gaming evolved title if it's on the AMD side. But they're very they're being very particular about not mentioning that terminology anymore, which I thought was weird. But it's still good to see that, you know, NVIDIA is pushing these developers with with technologies. You know, they they obviously feel a lot of pressure from AMD with the gaming evolved side of things, um, to to still prove to the enthusiasts and to the gamers that they're still involved in the market. Yes. Good. I'll agree with you. Good commentary. Sure. Good. And they also did this with uh, Call of Duty Ghosts uh, and Call of Duty Dogs, whichever one you're into. Uh, they are working on site at, at Infinity Ward to enhance the sub D tessellation, displacement mapping, and HDR lighting. They will also implement uh, the company's TXAA, temporal anti aliasing, and PhysX technologies. Maybe yes. they have some nice hair. Effects. No, that's Tress Effects, and that is AMD Gaming. No, and NVIDIA has a uh, hair effects that they're starting to shop around. Well, all these people in this screenshot appear to be wearing masks and helmets, so I don't think it's really going to matter. Well, and hair doesn't much. really particularly matter to me either. <laughs> so what do you think about you know, NVIDIA's push to... you know? Kind of, also, I should note this Call of Duty Ghost announcement never mentions the way it's meant to be played either. Again, very odd. But what do you think about NVIDIA's uh, efforts here to, you know, kind of push themselves back into the fold? AMD has definitely been the dominant player in terms of uh, mind share, in terms of being associated with the best games uh, and, and the Gaming Evolve program and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly NVIDIA had a step up for many, many years over AMD, especially with developer relations. And, uh, you know, some games just 
played a whole lot better on NVIDIA products, and yep. you sometimes you'd have to wait a couple of weeks before a patch came out for a certain game. Or in terms like you know Assassin's Creed, uh, they would release a, a 10.1, you know, a DX 10.1 patch, and then later recant that and say, well, we're just moving back to DX 10.0 because there were issues with 10.1. Um, I think that uh, it caught them by surprise that AMD was as aggressive as they were with um, getting the titles mm-hmm. that they did and the amount of market share that they actually gained over the past couple of quarters in discrete graphics because, hey, you buy our $150 card, you get another $100 worth of games. You buy a $250 card and it's 150 bucks worth of games. Mm-hmm. Uh, these were positive things that consumers saw because, in the end, it's uh, you know money is is the bottom line. And there are some people out there who say you know I'll never buy AMD because they have bad drivers, or I'll never buy Nvidia because they had a stranglehold on developers and they you know limited the things that they were able to do. Those are very few people. I mean, they're loud. You will see them say that over and over again on forums. But the vast majority of people will think with their wallet and say, hey, you know, I get a lot more value out of this than if I were to go with the other side, even though I'd get similar performance. Um, I, I agree. I, I think... When I, I think they did catch Nvidia off guard with the with the whole bundling thing, and, and they they did a very good job in that way. I it still weirds me out that they're not using the way it's meant to be played. It makes me think that there's some kind of other agreement with these publishers where they maybe they're still part of the gaming evolve program, but they're still allowed to work with Nvidia to implement specific technologies. I don't really know. I'll be curious to see what happens this fall. I, maybe they can't be the way it's meant to be played games if they're going to be on consoles. I guess that doesn't really matter, right? It shouldn't. Well, they've they've sunk money into Tegra. Um, Well, and look look how much money they sunk into that GeForce Experience thing. I mean, I still get that on my NVIDIA drivers. Oh, GeForce Experience has a update or whatever. I got that today. That's that's very because they sunk a lot of money into that GeForce Experience thing. Yep. Uh, All right, let's talk about uh, some new cases. Were announced this week. Cooler Master showed off at uh, Gamescom. The Cosmos SE, which I don't know what that stands for. I guess special edition. This looks. Uh, Ken pointed out this looks very much like the old original Cosmos case, Cosmos S. Sorry, uh, with just a few minor changes there. That's not as exciting. But I think these two Lian Lee cases are pretty interesting. This is the uh, Lian Lee PCQ33. This is apparently just a prototype. Uh, it's a mini ITX chassis but it has a hinged front panel that allows unfettered access to the internal hardware. Now, if we scroll down a little bit here, check out this photo. Oh my God, that's awesome. Unfettered. And it shows you how the front panel folds down so that you can work on all the components. You have tons of space, right? And then when you close it, it's a, it's a small little box again, right? And you don't have to worry about taking off doors. You don't have to like the, the top being in the way. Uh, I think this is pretty awesome. And uh, they talk about having, um, uh, let's see, what's it talk about here? The removable dust filter to add to be the case if there's enough interest. So this is still like in the prototyping stage. Uh, I don't know anything about availability of it. Um, the hinge front panel is, uh, Tim wrote this up for us, is a neat idea and should make it extremely easy to work on the PC. Uh, you get this, you get one of those direct CU minis that Josh reviewed. Maybe you get a 670 or maybe by now, maybe by then we'll have a, you, uh, I don't know. If you look at that picture, you can see. That's basically, that's basically yeah, like that's a perfect the, open, maybe. it's like an open test bed that closes up into a case. Yeah. But really. I, I think it looks like, uh, it looks like you have to have a short graphics card. Uh, I'm going to think you do. Well, it doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist yet, but maybe. I'm trying to see if there's any, if Tim had any of those specific specs in here. So it only measures 9 by 13 by 10. So looks like it's 13 tall. Yeah. 9 wide yeah. and then 10 deep. Yeah. <laughs> if you know what he's saying. I don't. Okay. Uh, Lee and Lee has asked enthusiasts to comment on the new turtle prototype case, which you can do 
uh, on a forum thread at Extreme Systems. But uh, go to PCPR.com, look up for the post that says Lian Lee shows off PCQ33, PCQ33 Prototype Mini ITX. Now, on the exact opposite side of that is this, the Lian Lee PCA79 Full Tower Case. Um, this is enormous. It is 24 and a half inches by nine inches by 23 and a half inches or so. Weighs as much as a small child, <laughs> maybe even a medium sized child. Uh, it is, let me see what we've got here. It's, Actually, uh, it may not weigh that much, Josh, because it looks like it's all aluminum inside. Yeah, this, this is the picture. If we scroll on one more, there's a, there's a picture of the inside here. And you can see that they, they've got those grommeted holes in now that are very popular. You've got support for well, maybe only nine hard drives there but well spaced it's got two wheels on the back but not wheels on the front which i think is kind of weird that's a little odd you can cut yeah i mean you could lift it up a little bit and, and roll it around but why not just put all four wheels on it at that point i had i had a uh, system a long time ago who the hell made it i think it was an inwin case that had four wheels on it i don't remember now and i, and I think I, I had one of those leanne lees it was like the giant cube yeah, with the, and it with had, the wheels, you know, the big, the big, yeah, wheels on the bottom. Yeah, you kick it across the room. <laughs> uh, it's expected to have an MSRP of three hundred eighty-nine bucks, uh, and available in September. This one is not the, a prototype. The thing that strikes me odd about that case, Ryan, is the fact that it's they kept it to the same uh, width inside as as a normal case it doesn't look like it's much wider correct like if you, if you take the um what the corsair 900d it is yeah that thing is not not quite double wide but it's at least one a quarter one and a half times i mean it's physically wider than normal case and for you that much money in that big of a case without you making think it that mad. they want to make it a little wider than normal i agree i think having some more space behind there would be would be nice um, and as tall as it is, you could get away with adding a little width to it, and it wouldn't really look weird. But I wanted to point out in this, this screenshot from this video, uh, it has a motherboard tray. It has a removable motherboard tray. When's the last, the last time you've time seen one of those? The last time I had one of those was another Lee and Lee case. <laughs> I know. I remember uh, Lee Garbett, our power supply and cooling guy, we built his original test bed, his like heat sink test bed, off of uh, motherboard trays from Lee and Lee cases. And just kind of mount it to it. That was like our open air test bed at the time. Actually, Ryan, the uh, half XB has a removable motherboard tray. Does it really? Yes, it does. Oh. Yeah, that's a very nice case. Oh. It, it was a cool idea. It never quite worked out as well as I wanted it to because you had to disconnect so many wires at that point to, to really get in there. I don't know. And especially with a case this size, do you really need to remove it? But the whole idea was, right, you could remove it install the motherboard easily, install some of those components easily, and then slide it back in, uh, whereas now you have more than enough space to, to really get inside there and work on things. So uh, does anybody care that DirectX 11.2 will be back updated for Radeon HD 7000 series GPUs? You know, we've, we might have seen this before with DirectX 10.1. Uh, okay. How big of an impact was that? I mean, you played I mean, that pink direct X eleven dot one yeah. hasn't With really made an impact. Yes, I did. I did. Yeah, and Assassin's Creed. Bigger problem. The only bigger problem titles. there. The bigger problem with direct X eleven dot one is going to be it's going to it will be in a Windows eight dot one exclusive. They're not. It won't support Windows eight, and will they? From what I've heard, they will not be putting it back to Windows seven either. So hmm. you will have to be running Windows eight right. dot in order to use it. So niche inside of a niche. Running Windows 8? Nope. Running Windows 8.1? Yep. Okay, now you can use a DirectX 11.2. And to be honest with you, I haven't heard any, either of the GPU vendors talk about 11.2 and what advantages it was going to offer. So at this point, I don't think it's a, it's a very big deal. Uh, AMD. Josh, do we want to... We're, we're running late on stuff, but do you want to mention anything on the possible delay of a couple of those AMD chips running yeah, around? Kaveri is the one that's that's the big. That's the big, next big jump for AMD. It, it, it's the first HSA, well, Huma com, compliant part. <gasps> Huma. Huma. And, uh, yeah, it does look like it's a couple of months delayed. Mm-hmm. Unfortunate for AMD. They're, they're trying to do some damage control, it seems like. It's not horribly delayed, but it certainly seems like they're 
having problems with Global Foundries, mm. who's their 28 nanometer partner with this particular part, and uh, they're a couple of More months work. behind schedule. But it's it's like one and a half, two months, maybe three months at max. So it's not a huge delay, yeah. especially when you're rolling out a brand new socket, a socket infrastructure, you know, FM2+, plus. Yep. well, kind of brand new. But uh, yeah. It's, was, it's going to show up later than than what they originally expected. I but was, they're telling you that they're not. Yeah, I always find it interesting when these companies don't like like we were all there sitting in a room at CES when they very specifically gave a timeline. And now oh, yeah, it'll be out in November. And you're now you're missing that timeline. And then they always say, "No, no, this was always the plan." It's like, so either you're lying now, or you're really bad at telling us your plan. Then neither of those answers are really good. You know, I, I don't know. I, there's obviously just a lot of, of, of pushback when any time the word late or delay is mentioned when you're a publicly traded company that has been on the ropes for a little while, like AMD has. So uh, good luck with that. I think Kaveri will be an interesting part eventually, whenever it comes out. Uh, and finally, we'll uh, bring up the Windows 8 RTC bug. Benchmark results banned at HW bot, hardware bot. Uh, I don't really know anything about this. Does somebody want to explain it to me? I believe when you overclock or underclock certain Intel parts in a certain way Mm -hmm. that it skews the results far more than what they should be. So people were getting exceptionally high results by kind of messing with some of the clocks in there and it messed with the the high-performance real-time timer okay i can't remember what it is yeah and so it would skew the results in a positive way if they did it in a certain way and so a lot of people thought that it was cheating which it kind of is because it's inaccurate so it looks like it was if you boot it up at a normal speed to windows and then down clocked in software like if you used, you know, some Asus or MSI or Gigabyte software to downclock like the B clock on your part a little bit, that some adjustment wasn't being made to the to the timer. Because uh, I knew, knew AMD came out to us and said, hey, this doesn't affect us. All the scores you see with AMD parts are completely valid. You know, here's how you can prove it, all that kind of deal. So it's, it's an interesting little thing. Uh, it doesn't really affect most people who listen to this because most of us aren't competitively overclocking uh, and competitively benchmarking. When we do benchmarking, you know, it's something we'll, we'll, we'll keep a little bit of an eye out for, but we're not you know, downclocking our parts once we get into Windows that I've ever done for any testing, at least. So uh, our, our CPU metrics should be completely viable. Ryan, you know what could down? Um, see, I don't. I, I was reading that too, but there is a case where you could, where the uh, motherboard and the BIOS would actually down clock the CPU automatically if you're using, uh, I think it's EIST or um, one of those things will actually down clock the CPU quite a bit when it's idling. Yeah, so. yeah, no, no. They're talking about downclocking the, the base clock, the B clock, uh, not just not the multipliers, right? So that the, e, uh, the EIST, which is the Enhanced Intel Speed Step, Speed Step, that should be two S's, but whatever. Uh, it is, it's the ability to, to lower the clock speeds when you're at idle, so you're, you're running lower power consumption. That, I think, is, is not part of the issue. I think it's, I think it's just the B clock. Uh, that is the issue, the CPU B clock. So, and only in Windows 8, not Windows 7, apparently. So, who the hell knows what's going on? Um, <clears throat> let's get into our hardware software picks of the week. Now, Alan, yes. uh, which one of these links should I click? Pricing was definitely not or kidding. Yeah, so the 840 Evo, I'm sort of stealing Maury's thing. No, no, no. It's not your, it's not your turn uh, yet. I just want to know what link to use. Because I was having a discussion with uh, one of our readers. Do you like the pricing one? That's the, the smallest one. That goes from small to big of the five different capacities of the 840 Evo on Newegg selling, although I will say the 500 gig is sold out right now, but they're all selling for about 70 cents a gig. 
And it's not and like on a sale, sale. You can get them for cheaper. It's not like anything, you know, crazy super summer sale, whatever. None of that. It's just that's the price. Uh, so the one terabyte is six hundred and forty-nine bucks. Yep, which is exactly what they promised at the press thing. Alan, do you need to get paid? Nah, huh? I, you're right. You don't. It's fine. We'll be we'll be good. <laughs> Order three of these, Ken. We'll be fine. It's great. Um, so that was your pick too, Maury. Was eight forty Evo? Yeah, yeah. The the uh, two fifty. Uh, specifically, two fifty for one hundred eighty-two bucks. Yep, and that is really cheap. Uh, one twenty gig for one hundred eight. Might as well get the two fifty, or might as well get the one terabyte in my book. Uh, so my pick is we're just gonna I'm gonna phone it in this week and say it was this lightning card. I actually had that in the show notes as it. Uh, <clears throat> it's a it's a great card. It's super expensive. But in terms not of not super super expensive, it, it's not super super expensive. But it's expensive. It's not a thousand dollars, but it is seven hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> read that review if you think you might be interested in it. Other than that, I'll, I'll just leave it alone. And uh, Josh, me, we're gonna go last today. This is the exact opposite of super exp- super expensive. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, last week I picked one of these up. For nineteen dollars, still in the package. Link, metal case. Well, hang on, hang on. Eight port gig e switch, mm-hmm. latest you know nine k jumbo blah, blah. frame crap. They're fast, nicely built, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. fair warranty. It was nineteen bucks. Nineteen bucks last week. It's back up to thirty nine dollars. Oh, jeez. Keep watch on it because it's obviously. Going to have some specials on it. Now, Alan, tell me, tell me everything that's wrong with this Switch, Alan. Uh, the only thing I don't like about it is that I don't think it has dual port multi-link ability for if you're trying to... Say you have a motherboard that has dual gigabit and you want to pass that to, to the Switch and then span it out from there mm. and use okay. the uh, increased that's bandwith. A, that's, that's a pretty high-end feature. That's, yeah, but are you really yeah, going to use that's... teaming, though? I mean, hey, look, Ryan wanted something wrong with it, so I pulled something out of my butt. <laughs> I, Ryan, there I think the go. only thing wrong with it in Alan's opinion is he doesn't have it. No, that's got to be twenty bucks for a gigabit eight port switch. Come on, that's yeah, that's awesome. I paid way more than yeah. that. So you have you have you been running it yet, Josh, or is it still in the pack? Not yet. It's still it's still shrink wrapped. Mm. So, uh, but I did get three of them total: two for work, one for me. The ones that work seem to work fine. That's you know what, uh, this is completely anecdotal, but I will say that before building this office space and connecting 20, your glued, 25 your glued switch yes and connecting 25 different devices to a switch you know i used to say that a switch is stupid just hook it up and it'll work and my, my experience now is that is that is not the case that the difference between a cheap ass like 24 port unmanaged gigabit switch and a higher end managed 24 port gigabit switch is fairly substantial is that is that a fair sentiment yes okay i mean it depends on usage and yeah and how knowledgeable you are i think i think for for a home office you know, like this eight port gigabit switch is probably perfect, right? And I have, I think I have an eight port and a five port at my house. Um, but for here, we're running, you know, a lot of, you know, all network storage. Uh, we're doing HDMI over Ethernet sometimes. There's a lot of crap moving around in the office. And there's been a couple of times where, you know, network traffic dies. And if you unplug a network port from a particular computer like unplug the network cable from the computer like everything works again because it's just like crapping that's all over switch. the network yeah that's a that's a crap switch uh, so what what's what you're using now that's good i'm not gonna none none what? i'm still using the crap one i oh. guess is the answer to that Asus i just switch i just you know it was it was incredibly inexpensive and now it's glued to the wall <laughs> <laughs> so it's just just got to deal with it right and it <laughs> Just glue another one on top of it. I can, we can, yeah, you know what? 
Yeah, you know, oddly space enough, space. I, I did, you know, for work, I, I work in an office that has a lot of workstations. Yep. And I got one of the D-Link 24-port web smart switches mm-hmm. that it's not, you know, the fully... Fully God, managed so, type thing. Fully managed, but it's got a web interface and you can do some interesting things with that. And it does take a little longer for it to boot up than a, than a standard switch, but I've had like zero problems with that one yeah. in, in a, a workplace environment where, you know, we're, we're working with TIFF files that are multi-gig in size. Mm, yeah. Yeah, like I <laughs> t- just, for example, today I backed up a Steam library that was about 180 gigs and downloaded 80 gigs of a Dropbox storage thing to a different array and just, you know... It's a lot of crap moving around. It didn't have any problems today. I don't know why I'm bringing this up. I just, just, just one of those things. That's it. That's all I got. Uh, I guess that's it. Anybody else? No, I just decided you don't. We don't have anything else to talk about. Uh, if you are watching us live, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, sorry about the little hiccups at the beginning. If you are not joining us live, shame on you. You should do so. We recorded on Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Pacific, and now... Now we have a fully functional notification system to let you know when we're going live. If you go to PCPer.com and uh, you look on the right-hand side, you'll see PC Perspective Upcoming Events. And it'll have a, sc- a calendar there. It'll have a timer to let you know when our next event is. And then right underneath that, you'll see Get Notified When We Go Live. And all you have to do uh, is click that. It takes you to this little page where you put your name and your email in. And then we send you a notification when we're getting ready to go live. I sent it out tonight, like 10 minutes before 10. Let everybody know that we were streaming uh, wonderful music that everybody enjoyed before the stream started. And uh, you got to be part of the fun. So we appreciate that. Sign up for that. That's all working. And uh, we should be good to go from that point out. And don't forget, if you have a Hearthstone beta key, send it to Ryan, Ryan at PCPer.com or rshroud at PCPer.com. All those, both of those will work. Uh, so we will be back next week with more technology news and information and all of our smiling faces. I'm Ryan Shroud. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Alan Malentano. And I'm Mara Titleman. <laughs> <laughs>